Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us at this late hour if you are on Eastern Time. It's a little bit more reasonable if you are on Mountain Time or Pacific. Um, my name is Kirsten Schroeder, and I'm joined here with Judy Arnell, who needs no introduction, I'm sure, but um, I'll give her a little introduction anyway. Um, so I'm Kirsten. I'm a physiotherapist. Mother of four, I'm a Lamaze Certified Childbirth Educator, and this is my first webinar that I'm kind of the main presenter. I've been a co-presenter for several of them already. And of course, I'm here with Judy, who uh, is a extraordinary parenting author, educator, and speaker, and um, founder of Attachment Parenting Canada. So. Hello, Judy. Did you want to say anything else about yourself? <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm no. Thank you. <laughs> I think everybody. I think everybody listening probably already knows you, but yeah. Um, before we go um, further, can someone who's listening just please type in the little uh, box there to let us know that you can hear us, so that if we're having any kind of audio problems that we are aware of it. Okay, yep, they can hear. We're good? Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so just a little plug for Judy's books, The Discipline Without Distress, which I absolutely love, um, and then her newest book, Parenting with Patients, which I haven't personally had a chance to, to read yet, but I'm very excited to, so um, if you want further information on these topics, please check out those resources. Just a few housekeeping issues uh, just to go over. So you're all muted, but you're welcome to raise your hand in the question box and type a question. And we'll have a question and answer uh, period at the end of the webinar. If you prefer, you can private um, email us uh, any questions afterwards. Uh, if you are having any trouble hearing, if you put a headset on, you can usually hear better. And we say that all opinions are honored, and you are the expert on your own children, absolutely. And while this webinar is for education purposes, it is not in any way meant to replace medical advice. Just our little copyright. We don't record the webinars, so we can't give you a, a copy later. Um, it's just for uh, present viewing um, for uh, your educational purposes. So where our information comes from, it comes from a variety of sources, from parent effectiveness training, Alberta Health Services, uh, Positive Discipline, University of Calgary, um, and the Terrific Toddlers Program that was developed through Alberta Health. So we're going to start off talking a little bit about parent authority. So some of you might be coming here tonight. I imagine you're here tonight because maybe you're having some issues with toileting or with picky eating in your child. And when we kind of think about attachment parenting and some of the more current um, approaches to parenting, we have definitely had some differences. So if we think back to 30 years ago, maybe when some of us were parented, uh, it was more about elder respect, size, fear, you should listen to me because I'm your parent, do as I say, not as I do, things like that. But now we're, we are much more open to um, building relationships. And so we're looking for open communication and mutual respect. So I just want you guys to do an activity. If you have access to a piece of paper, I would like you just to pull out a, a sheet of paper and a pen if it's handy. And I just want you to either fold the paper in, in half lengthwise or draw a line down the center of your paper. And I just want you to take a moment to think about some problems that you're dealing with right now with your own child. And I want you just to kind of write some of those challenges that you're dealing with on the left side of the paper. Just kind of make a quick little list of some things that are particularly 
may be troubling you at the moment. And then I just want you to take a moment to close your eyes and visualize your child. Now envision them at 17 years of age. They're so grown up. Who do you see? And what kind of person do you hope they will become? Now just take another moment to write some of those qualities that you hope to see in your child when they're older, an older teenager, maybe even as an adult. And I want you to write some of those qualities down on the right side of your paper. So on this slide, our lists are flipped, the ones I asked you to put on the right or on our left and vice versa. But I wonder how many of the points that you wrote on your sheet are similar to the ones that are on this list here. So if you're listening to this webinar tonight, possibly it's because of toileting challenges or you know, you're having trouble getting your child to eat vegetables. Um, but paying more attention to the qualities you want to see later on down the road with your teenager, maybe you have some similar qualities that you're hoping to see as well. So the items on the right side of your sheet are like a roadmap or a guide for how we want to treat our children as they're growing up. And the way we deal with these behaviors in the younger child years, those the list on the left, should absolutely be influenced by the list on the right. right? Can you see the connection? So in terms of the short term, we're thinking we want to stop behaviors that are troublesome. We want our children to listen to us. And we want to find ways to cope with anger on, on our, our own part. If uh, we're having trouble with you know, dealing with our stress and uh, saying things maybe that we regret later, being highly critical, yelling, things like that. We want to try to, to deal with those behaviors. Now, we're all human, and there are no perfect parents, absolutely. Um, and fortunately, children are very resilient. However, we want to try to um, choose more positive ways of dealing as our kind of our uh, majority of the time. So in terms of the long term, we're looking for creating connection and belonging. We want to teach things like self-control, social, emotional, and life skills. And of course, building the bond helps to build the brain. And that's kind of what attachment parenting is all about. And that's what we, I'm sure, have in common is that we want to build that attachment and that bond with our children from the beginning, from a young age, so we can help them with their brain development and have good relationships with them over the long term. So we really feel that a positive approach is better than a negative one. So maybe we grew up with parents that um, felt like in order to make their children do better, that they should criticize or blame or really um, be hard on them, punish, um, because the belief was kind of if we make the children feel bad, then they'll want to do better, right? Um, maybe some of us are familiar with the phrase, you should be ashamed of yourself. And when you really step back and think about that, do we ever really want our children to feel shamed or, or to feel ashamed of themselves? No, because the truth of the matter is children who feel better do better. And so um, encouraging and using positive discipline strategies are much better in the long run. 
All right, so before you came onto this webinar, you should have received a link to do a survey. And at the end of the webinar, you will receive another link to do the same survey again. And so I'm just going to briefly go through some of the questions so that you can, um, so that you have the answers and you can go through after. It's really important that you do the surveys if you haven't done it before. Um, because that's how we kind of prove to our funding sources that the participants are getting some benefit from these webinars. So, number one, the cognitive development. Children under age five listen about 40% of the time. So it's unrealistic to expect that they are going to listen more than that. But from about three to five years, they comply about 40%. From zero to two, they comply about 5% of the time. And fortunately, by about age six to 12, it goes up to about 60%. And hopefully, your teenagers complying more than 60%. Number two, so the best discipline tools for toddlers, change the environment or use redirection. And basically, for changing the environment, we're talking mainly about childproofing. Why are toddlers aggressive? It's because their verbal ability is not competent. It's common for them to hit, to bite, to throw, to push from about 10 months to four years of age. And some more spirited children may actually um, continue those behaviors to a little bit older than that. Number four, your best discipline tools for preschoolers. Staying with your no is really important and problem solving for next time. We know that children gain better self-control by age six. So that prefrontal cortex, the, the kind of front part of the brain that is responsible for gain, gaining more self-control in humans, uh, goes through a rapid development. Uh, so that by about age six, there is significant better self-control ability. Uh, then there is another rapid phase of development around puberty. And a lot of neurologists agree that it's not really fully developed until closer to age 25. So it's not very realistic to expect that a very young child is going to have good self-control. It's just not developmentally appropriate. So about 95% of children have temper tantrums. Um, more spirited children can last longer and they can be exhausting. It's important to stay with your no. And kind of looking for ways to prevent them by Developing routines, making sure children are fed regularly, that they have their, their naps and their appropriate sleep schedules. So um, you can try to prevent them as much as possible. Best way to handle parents' anger are parent timeouts, getting yourself calm first, and of course separating your anger from your discipline. So trying to uh, get yourself calm down to a state so that you're not operating in your kind of primal brain so that you're able to use your prefrontal cortex as well to, uh, to be able to get yourself calmed down and you're not dealing in high stress mode when you're trying to deal with your child who's possibly behaving in a way that is not acceptable to you. So for school age children and teens, Declaring your unhappiness with an I statement, going for a walk and talk discussion, and problem solving are really good strategies that work for that age group. So children misbehave because they have limited brain development or they have a need or feeling. Judy, can you, um, can you chime in here about the green, is that green beer? Is that St. <laughs> Patrick's Day? St. Patrick's Day was last week. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, I did. Um, actually, I tinted the water just to show the water is clear. Can you hear me? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so what that shows is uh, this was Piaget's famous experiment where he um, he would give a four-year-old 
um, a glass of water and put it in a different shaped glass. And he said to the four-year-olds, um, is that the same amount of liquid? And four-year-olds, they said, no, it changed, <laughs> right? And it got less liquid or more liquid. So just to show that four-year-olds can't have that kind of logical perception that we think they do. And then by seven years, you can pour the liquid into a different shape glass and they know it's the same amount. It's just changed shape. So by seven, they have the logic. At four, they don't. But the trouble is parents think that four-year-olds can understand logical consequences when they can't. Yeah. But, yes, you know, very good. I, I like the green beer idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just St. Patrick's Day, so it's on my mind. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> oh, that's too cute. Um, so I'm not going to read all these out, but just in terms of discipline for question 10, if you have a three-year-old and under, they have little self-control, so the, there's a list of some things that can be helpful. Strategies. And for four years old and over, they're gaining more self-control, so there are some other approaches that you can take like making games and using natural consequences, guided problem solving, things like that. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about toilet learning. So basically, just as an overview, children should really be the ones to take the lead in toilet learning. And the parent's role is actually to provide information and support for the child. Um, as we know, the three things that you cannot make a child do are eating, sleeping, and toileting. And these are the key, three key areas where you're mo most likely to have power struggles if um, you try to take control and try to make them do. Uh, the things the way that you think they should is probably going to backfire on you. So that can be, they can be real battleground um, areas of life for these young children. Um, it's good to think of yourself as a, as a toileting facilitator rather than a trainer. Um, there's different roles that uh, parents have compared to what children have when it comes to learning toileting. So the parent is responsible for the what and the where. So in terms of uh, you know, showing the child where they're going to use the toilet, purchasing the potty, you can even kind of have enlist the child's help in picking out that potty, let them play with it a little bit. Um, but you're there to provide the resources. The child is responsible for the when. And children really vary quite considerably in their readiness to use the toilet. Um, you can't make a child use the toilet. Uh, when parents take a approach that the child needs to learn toileting on a specific parent-driven timetable, it's likely to backfire. So uh, pressures sometimes can be surrounding things like daycare or preschool. You know, the child can't come unless they're toilet trained. And so the parent feels like, oh, they have to be toilet trained by this particular age. And it's just not really fair to the child. Because if they're not ready, they're not ready. And it's going to be much more difficult. And if I could interject here. Um, this is the time of the year parents start getting really anxious because they, they, um, they've camped out all night. They got their child in preschool for September. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and now the push is on. And, um, you know, it's like you said, you can't force it and sometimes it backfires. So we tell parents, well, okay, give it a go now. But if it's not working in a month, put them back in diapers a lot can change until September like that's still you know five months away and kids can develop during that time absolutely and so I've, I always found that I don't know what you thought about this Judy but I always thought that summertime was a great time for toilet training because I would let my kids go outside 
you know, with no pants on, <laughs> and that seemed to kind of help them, you know, if they had kind of urine dribbling down their leg, they kind of, you know, thought, I mean, if they were ready, it wasn't like, if you know, that was a way to get a child that's not ready to be able to, but it seemed to kind of help if a child, if some of my children who were ready, so, yeah. um, we did that too, and then and we went. I think we went camping, and within about three days, they had got it right. Because you're right, yeah. they just ran around naked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then they have to have that awareness. It's yes, just there. Yeah. So just some facts. Um, typically, girls. Not not this is not a hard and fast rule, but typically girls are ready before boys. Uh, most children are not ready before the age of two and a half. And any child between the ages of two and three, it can be tricky with uh, toilet learning. This is the age where we feel like, okay, now's the time to start. But really, it's also a developmental stage where a lot of children are quite contrary. And um, it can be about can become a battleground. So you have to watch for those readiness signs, which we'll talk more about here in a moment. But averaging two and a half to three and a half years of age, um, and that can be quite variable. I remember when my oldest was, it was about two and a half, between two and a half and three, I think. And I was feeling lots of pressure from external sources that, well, why isn't he potty trained yet? And I talked to a friend of mine who had a, a, a little girl who was right around the same age as my son, and her, her daughter had been potty trained already for, for several months. And I asked her, oh, well, how did you do it? And she said, well, I just explained to her that now we go on the toilet. And I thought, oh, wow, you just, ex you just explained to her. <laughs> yeah. That, that's not going to work. <laughs> You know, this, this little girl who was very compliant, very, um, you know, easygoing, you know, that worked for her, but that is not the norm, I think, and it's certainly with a, with a rough and tumble active little boy that I had, there was going to be no explaining to him that, oh, now we're going to use the toilet at, you know, two and a half, and he's just going to start doing it. No, it was much closer to three and a half before he was really ready. It just shows you how different they all are, eh? Absolutely. I mean, with my four children, I had I have children that train. One that trained just past his second birthday, and two that were you know three and a half. Yeah. So, yeah, it's yeah. you know it's so variable even in the same family. Yeah. So typically, children will get control of their bowels first, then progress to urine day first, and then night. And I'll talk a little bit more about bed wet bed wetting here in a moment. So the process. For many children, if, you, if they're starting the process at two years old, it's going to take months. If you start at two and a half years, it takes weeks. And if you start at four years, it may only take days. So also something to think about when you're making the decision for how, um, how you're going to approach this. So some of the signs of readiness, right, of course, they have to be physically ready in, in the sense of their control of those muscles that control the bowel and bladder, the sphincter muscles. Uh, they have to have somewhat of a regular um, elimination pattern that you've been able to recognize. They have cognitive awareness. They can understand instructions and follow directions. They, they can hold and stay dry for at least a couple of hours. And then you also have to think about their physical ability to be able to pull their pants down and up. Um, can they do that? Can they do that yet? Yeah, it's ideal if you can have them wearing clothing that is very easy to pull down when you're working on um, toileting. And it's also best to make sure that they're in a particularly cooperative stage in their development. Uh, it's best to avoid toilet learning strategies if they are, if there's you know, been a recent move or there's a lot of stress in the family or a new baby. Things like this um, can really uh, prove to be a, a not so great time to start toileting. Um, you want to give your child words to use that are uh, familiar to them, like if they want to say pee or poop, 
words that other people in their life, other caregivers or grandparents are going to also recognize. Um, and it's best to avoid using negative descriptions like messy, dirty, stinky, things like that. Um, as Judy and I already mentioned, letting your child be naked doesn't work so well in the house. <laughs> That's why this summer can be a good time if you can be outside more. But, you know, if you have uh, non-carpeted floors and you want to give it a whirl inside, then that, that can be helpful as well. And in terms of best practices, you just really want to clean up these messes really matter-of-factly. Uh, not get upset if there are messes, not show anger, certainly not shaming or criticizing, um, really just trying to stay encouraging. Some children respond well to rewards and really just if they're ready. Um, one of my sons really responded well to the stickers. Um, even you get so many stickers on his chart and he would get to pick out a little, a little toy after 10 stickers or whatnot. Um, and that worked really well when he was ready would not have worked if he wasn't ready. Um, you just want to think, give them time, patience, and opportunities to practice. It's also important to note that even after some children have mastered toileting and you think, okay, we're good to go now, they've got this down, some may regress at some point down the road. Some may refuse to use the toilet or have accidents later on down the road. And this is often normal. Um, it can also be due to different kinds of emotional upset or changes in their life, illness, but really most commonly it's just a natural part of the learning process. So in terms of bedwetting, so typically girls are dry by age six and boys by age seven. That's kind of what's considered normal. But if you, if you have a child who has been dry at night for some time and they have the occasional bedwetting episode, that can be normal as well. If you have a child that's above these ages and they're consistently having problems with bedwetting, it's good to talk to your doctor about that. And also be aware that there are some physiotherapists that are actually trained in pediatric pelvic floor uh, rehab therapy for um, these non-invasive approaches to basically um, teach the child better control using biofeedback and different exercises. Um, it's also interesting that there is definitely a family history component to bedwetting. So if one parent wet the bed when they were a child, your, your child would have a 44% chance of bedwetting also. And if both parents had problems with bedwetting as children, that rate goes up to 77%. Um, without any family history, it's about 15%. So um, we know that about 95% of children are dry at night by age 10. But if you have a child that's kind of in that six to ten year old range and they want to go to sleepovers or they want to go to you know camp even stay at grandma's house and they're embarrassed because of the bed bedding just know that there are resources um, pelvic health physiotherapists for pediatrics are not all that common but you just have to check the resources and see if you can find one in your area um, there are also different kinds of alarms that you can purchase that um, will alert the child if there's some wetness in the bed and hopefully be able to stop them to be able to get up. Um, that's another option. I certainly wouldn't recommend trying something like that until they were above these kind of typical ages for, for bed wetting, but if they're still struggling. Kirsten, we had um, one child who um, he was a sound sleeper. He still is a sound sleeper. He could sleep on a concrete floor. And um, <laughs> he, uh, we found that um, he went to bed typically about nine, nine when he was <laughs> three. And we would, all through those years, like three, four, five, six, we would wake him up by the time we went to bed, which was about 11 or midnight, and just kind of 
steer him half asleep to the bathroom to have a final pee. And that seemed to help the bedwetting. So he never yeah. totally woke up. He just zombied, went to the bathroom. And then nights that we forgot where we were out late, guaranteed he wet the bed until he, yeah. you know, um, just until he could be woken up on his own. That seemed to help. But right. Yeah, yeah. Certainly sound sleeping. Can, you just don't wake up. Some children just don't wake up for, yeah. for anything. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. All right. So now we're going to move on to talking a little bit about picky eating. And so um, one thing to consider is that label uh, as a picky eater. So uh, be, be, just be mindful of how your words might influence how you feel about your child or how they might influence how your child feels about themselves. So if they're kind of called the picky eater of the family, right? So maybe you might want to consider another word like selective. You're a selective eater. <laughs> right? I, I, I have a quote unquote picky eater in my household. <laughs> Could you call them a distinguished uh, culinary <laughs> Chooser. Exactly. Very fine culinary cheese. Very selective event. Exclusive. <laughs> yeah. yeah, really. Um, so, some key content for picky eating. Um, it's important to recognize that parents and children have different roles in the feeding relationship, right? Just like we talked about different roles in the, in the toilet facilitating. And while good nutrition is, uh, is of course, essential, we want to help our children to develop a healthy attitude towards food. That's really, really important. So when we look at the feeding relationship, the parent's job is the what, when, and where, and the child's job is the if and how much. So in terms of what, we want to be thinking about variety, nutritious snacks, um, giving lots of opportunities to try different foods, um, when we think about the when, about every two hours, we want to be offering either a snack or a meal. We want to try to designate routines uh, and, de and meal times that are consistent. Uh, and we want the where to be preferably at the table, right, with, with an adult present, uh, engaging in the social aspect of meals, uh, being in front of the television, not so great. Right? Because it kind of um, teaches that mindless eating, that lack of awareness, and just kind of becomes a habit instead of hunger. Know that food jags are normal. Right, A lot of children will just start to eat one food for a while. They don't really or a select kind of amount of, of foods. That's quite common. Um, it's good to have milk and juice, limiting juice to about half a cup a day, really, of unsweetened juice to meals, and then offering water in between meals for hydration. And recognizing that it does take about 15 tries for some children to accept a, a new food. And so trying to encourage a no thank you bite where they uh, just take one bite and they don't have to have any more if they don't like it, but just try it, right? So um, this division of roles in the parent-child feeding relationship really helps them to learn to trust their own sense of hunger and fullness, right? As we mentioned earlier, we can't make a child eat. Um, I don't know if any of you experience as children the you are not leaving the table until you clean that plate type of approach, right? Um, my, my sister growing up was a, a selective eater. <laughs> and um, I, you know, I watched her go through this, you know, several times over the course of our childhood. It wasn't always from my parents. Sometimes it was grandparent or aunt who was babysitting, and they were going to be the one, by golly, to get this child to eat. And guess what? It never worked. They, <laughs> she would stick to her ground, and she was not eating it, and, you know, hours would go by, and they would eventually give in, and my sister won. <laughs> oh, really? I remember growing up with that, and um, I, I just had a distaste for fish. And every Friday night, we were Catholic, right? So... Okay. Um, 
was the battle at the dinner table, and I would sit there for three hours and not eat it. Like I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. That was totally my sister too. She would, she would not back down. So no. yeah. <laughs> it's not a battle that a parent really probably wants to enter because chances are you are not going to win. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So just to kind of get a sense of how much children eat, right, so the small little marbles there are for newborns, and then when you get to the peach colored ball, that is about the size of a six month old child's stomach. Uh, the green one is more like a toddler size stomach. And then the blue is the adult size. So if you kind of compare to the size of the, the little spoon there that we're often using to, with feeding, uh, look at that little peach ball. It's not really, <laughs> it's like one of those <laughs> spoon size, right, almost. So sometimes um, we have unrealistic expectations of how much a child will eat at the different ages. And I think it's better, uh, particularly with foods that maybe the child isn't so excited about, to underwhelm them as opposed to overwhelming them. So I think it would be music to most parents' ears if their child said, can I have some more peas? <laughs> as opposed to having a huge heap of peas that's just not even possible to, you know, for that child to ever finish. Um, and then it looks like they didn't really eat much. So I don't know if, if any of you tonight have babies, but, um, you know, typically uh, the recommendation is for solid food starting at about six months. Uh, and we're looking for kind of runny, mushy, lumpy, sticky consistencies and getting a little bit more into the cubed consistencies by 12 months, but that's variable as well. Some, some children between somewhere between 6 and 12 months may be able to pick up little, little pieces and they kind of enjoy feeding themselves that way. Um, you can pretty much start with anything. Um, it's best to wait about four days between introducing new foods just to make sure there aren't any reactions or allergies. And just remember that eating is a learned skill, right? It takes time. It's a, it's a multi-sensory, you know, with the physical picking up and feeling the food, smelling the food, tasting the food. It's, it, it's, a, it's a complete experience. And it's really, really important that we allow our children to, uh, to be able to kind of engage with their food a little bit, even outside of eating it. So maybe you put a new food on your child's tray and they don't eat it, but they kind of touch it and they play with it and they, they're smelling it and that's okay. They're, they're becoming acquainted with the food. Um, food on the plate is not necessarily wasted food because they are get, just getting a chance to um, experience that. And you can even talk about it a little bit with them, um, you know, the shapes and the colors and the consistencies and things like that. Um, so mainly formula or breast milk is really their main food still for the first year, exclusively for the first six months, and then um, still a primary source of nutrition from six to 12 months. Children do need more iron at six months, um, and they should be continuing to take their vitamin D supplements that are recommended from newborn. And it's really best to avoid those mesh bags, those mesh feeding bags that have become kind of popular um, over the, the last several years. Uh, and some some parents swear that they're just fantastic and they're you know they're they helped with teething and their their child really you know liked eating with them. But they actually have found that children do best and they learn best when they are able to use their own hands and their own spoon, and they learn more about eating that way. Um, if they're also, those bags are difficult to clean, uh, so there can be problems with um, bacterial contamination, which isn't good. And also, they have found that using those feeding bags increases the length of time that sugars in foods are actually in contact with the baby's teeth. So that increases the risk of tooth decay as well. So not really the best um, approach. 
in terms of toddlers. So we know that they're going to triple their birth weight in that first year, then gain five, or ten, five to ten pounds in the second year. And usually breakfast or lunch is the best meal of the day, and they may not eat as much later on in the day. And as we talked about already, we can't force them, and eating in front of screens is not the best approach. So some of the caution foods until the child is about four years old, like things like hard candies, nuts, whole wieners and whole grapes, things like that. And when we talk about avoiding foods, uh, this is mainly kind of like your processed foods with lots of added sugar, salt, and fat. Of course, children do need some degree of sugar, salt, and fats, but some of the added processed ones can be uh, problematic if that's their main source of nutrition. So I'm going to see if this link will work and show this on the screen because this is um, I like this website. It's it's healthyalberta.com and so this is the food serving sizes for ages one to four, and I also have the link there for they have one for ages five to eleven. So it really kind of shows you, you know, comparing it like fruit to a size of a tennis ball or a hockey puck. Um, or two erasers for cheese. So that really kind of gives you an idea of how much food is appropriate for that age group. And of course there's still going to be some variation, right? Some, some kids may not eat as much as other children. Um, and, but it gives you a kind of a nice guideline. So there's the link for the 5 to 11 year olds if you're interested on the Healthy Alberta site. That's great. Do they have servings for adults, too? Because I'm sure mine exceed those. <laughs> I know, right? I don't know. I only, I only looked for children. I, I, Matt, maybe they do. That would I don't want to know. Answer. Yeah, exactly. I know. Like when they say a serving of ice cream is half a cup, and you're like, oh, really? Yeah. Oh. No. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> so in terms of milk, Children should have whole milk until they're two, and then you can choose anywhere from skim up to 2%, and still recommend breastfeeding for up to two years and beyond. Um, Canadian Pediatric Society, Dietitians of Canada, um, and Health Canada all recommend uh, breastfeeding for six months exclusively, and then for up to two years and beyond. So some more tips for healthy eating that you can um, consider. Um, what are some of your favorites, Judy, that worked with your children? I think um, serving on, you know, sometimes kids don't like to come to the table, adult table, so we would serve on play dishes. That really worked. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we just move their little toddler table to our table and they would sit there. Um, and I wasn't a big hider of vegetables. I know that's really popular, but um, we we tried to just get kids to like different vegetables. But I, naturally, I think our kids had picky. I mean, they guaranteed they would eat frozen vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> like peas and carrots, they'd eat them frozen, and we thought, okay, well, let's serve them frozen. I mean, why do we have to cook them? So yeah. I found generally, oh, and they hated their food touching, so we would get those plates with the dividers on them. Um, and that, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, those um, are fun. Yeah, and I guess, you know, just not to call food good or bad, it's just food, so... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, I think we we get caught up in, you know, the vegetables are good for you, <laughs> and kind of really focus on that. And I think maybe that makes them go, oh, why would I want that then? <laughs> exactly. But, um, <laughs> and in the picky eating course, I think you know they recommended just putting um, the dessert, like the healthy dessert, on the same plate as the dinner, and and we're the ones who categorize it. But kids, they'll try everything if you don't you know say one's better mm -hmm. than the other yeah yeah absolutely um 
I know a couple of my kids really liked being able to kind of pour with uh, having the dishwasher lid open and being able to pour their own um, juice or, or, you know, cereal or whatever. Um, getting the kids involved, I think, in some of the food preparation at an age-appropriate level, uh, just letting them kind of um, experience food and when they're not expected to eat it, but just kind of helping prepare it, I think, can be helpful. Yeah. yeah. I, think it, I think it's really important to not um, use food as a reward. Mm -hmm. Right, we have that listed on here. Um, mm -hmm. Or as kind of a comfort. Um, it just doesn't really set up very healthy long-term habits for them down the road. If, you know, they kind of use food as a, as a comfort strategy or a coping mechanism. Yeah, yeah. Better to get them to get a hug rather than, you know, serve them a cookie kind of thing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so yeah, so there's some really nice uh, strategies and tips that, uh, that you can try if you haven't already, if your children are at that stage where uh, they're, they're starting to experience feeding and, and eating and uh, solid food. Uh, lots of really good ideas there. Of course, choosing food over vitamins or liquid formula is always preferred because of the fiber and the vitamins and minerals in their natural combination. And we want to think of times, think of meal times as not just a feeding experience, but uh, meeting also social, emotional needs, um, but just having realistic expectations of how long uh, a child might engage you know, <laughs> with you at mealtime. <laughs> it's going to be quite variable, right? So um, really just encouraging healthy uh, meal times that are uh, not only healthy physically for, the ch for our children, but just a way to really connect with each other and enjoy each other. I would say, like even now with our our teens, like unless it's a family formal dinner, we don't spend longer than 20 minutes at the table on a weeknight anyways. That's for, that's for teenagers. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, exactly. yeah. And then just uh, knowing that you have the ability to close your kitchen <laughs> if you want to <laughs> is important. I love that sign. Um, so, you know, if you offer your child a meal at noon, they don't want it. They, you know, you can't force them. They don't want it. Uh, just to let them know, okay, the next snack time will be 2 o'clock and stick with that, right? You can be kind but firm and help your child to know that, you know, it's not an all all day <laughs> short order cook restaurant <laughs> that's going on in your house and that might help you with some of your own sanity and time management. So if you are dealing with some of these challenges that are frustrating you, just always remembering to first get yourself calm, right? Timeouts are for us parents. And then we want to help get our child calm, and time in is for them. So reconnecting with our children and um, problem solving and just engaging with them. And then that time together. So your homework for this week, it's really easy, just to do one thing for yourself. Right, just remember, refuel, restore, and renew, because happy parents equals happy kids. I love this little parent's affirmation of imperfection, too, because none of us have this all figured out. We all have our days. We all have our times. I like to talk about how I can empathize with the, with the little two- and three-year-olds who are operating from their primal lizard brain. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I'm operating from there too and those high stress days, right, when we're in fight or flight mode ourselves. Um, and sometimes we, we don't uh, react. We react instead of respond and we don't um, behave in the way that is our kind of ideal. And 
that's okay that we're imperfect. Um, it's we're all we're all on a journey here, and we just try better the next day, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. We keep trying to do better. All right, so we'll take some um, questions if anyone has any questions, Judy. I don't know if any have come in, but I just want to let you know that our next webinar in this Families Forever series is uh, a new topic that we are putting together called Education Alternatives. And in that we're going to kind of have a panel of uh, different, um, per, um, different panelists that are going to talk about different kinds of education alternatives, including things like homeschooling, unschooling, Montessori. Um, and so that should be really interesting and informative and fun. So look for that on Wednesday, April 15th, 7 o'clock Mountain, 9 o'clock Eastern. If you're interested, you can go to APCA website and sign up. Um, I think what I, I think I've lost my question box. So you know what? I am just going to unmute everyone. And if you have a question, there's only three people here. So if you have a question, if you want to uh, ask it by talking. Hello? Anybody? <laughs> Anyone have any questions? Hi. Well, it doesn't sound like we have any questions, but if you think of anything that you want to ask or you don't want to ask um, live on the webinar, that's fine. Uh, just remember that you can email us, and our email addresses are on the screen right now. And just remembering that a relationship involves two people, so problem solve instead of punish and build the bond with your child. We really appreciate you joining us tonight for this webinar. We hope you found it informative and helped you on your parenting journey. And we hope you'll join us for future webinars with other topics.